Keisha and Jacob, you guys have seen the, you know, Haitian movement, and then you've seen what we're doing here in the States. And I think you're probably pretty familiar with both sides. And what we would like you to do is describe differences and similarities and maybe some things that would bring some clarity to what we're experiencing in the U.S. So first off, talk a little bit about what happened in Haiti and what's happening today. Yeah, so just a quick snapshot. Uh, we moved to Haiti. Um, we were probably the worst kind of missionaries uh, with all of the worst kinds of methodology, uh, dependence-based, self-centered, um, self as the plan. So we were always going to be limited, not knowing it at the time, going to be limited by our abilities, our calendar, our resources. We were going to make plans based on the needs right before us because we were the, we were the primary doers, you know? Um, and, uh, the Lord allowed us to fail miserably. Um, so, you know, our, our ship called, Hey, let's be missionaries sank. You know, and the Lord let us just kind of tread water. And then he invited us aboard his ship and allowed us to be a part of what he was already doing. You know, so it was that whole thing of stop asking God to bless what you're doing, but join in on what he's already doing because it's already blessed, you know, and it was it really was that that kind of scenario for us. Um, let's go back to the very like very, very beginning when you and Keisha, when you were reading Alan Hirsch like a madman and just you and Keisha were just grabbing, right? What was it that made you go, we've got to figure something out? What was happening in that environment? What was going on that you didn't know what to do with? We were restless and discontent, uh, both with mission models and with church models um, that we deemed were not biblical. And, and in fact, like we saw the, both of those done so poorly, we really saw it as complicit in a, in a religious, an oppressive religious system that we could just no longer tolerate. Um, and, and we were in the midst of it, you know, like, uh, you know, if you've seen the, the animated movie, A Bug's Life. And there's a point, you know, where, um, you know, the ant is out to look for these warrior bugs that would save them from the, you know, the evil grasshoppers. And, and uh, there's a miscommunication, right, where these, these circus bugs come in and realize what was expected of them, this high expectation that they were going to save them. Uh, and there was a realization for me in, in visiting one of the uh, you know, visiting a Haitian church one Sunday, sitting at the front row, hearing the pastor continue to talk about these Americans that were here visiting today. And, uh, you know, he had shown me this land they wanted to buy. He pointed out his, his microphone and sound system and all the things that he was told he needed to have his very own church, right? You know, we're meeting on the rooftop of his house and um, we're sitting on the front row and this realization came over like, oh, wow, were those circus bugs where they were expecting us to to come in and save the day and, uh, and, and pull them out of poverty and provide all that they needed and buy the land and build this nice building and, and uh, you know, and, and, and save his church, right? And, and seeing what true poverty is um, and having desperate need um, and having, you know, knocks at the gate just constantly looking to the outsider to save everything. Um, and then going to a legacy church there in Haiti that was designed specifically for missionaries, but they were, it was, um, uh, intermixed 
um, but they did not do well with that. And um, seeing their lack of um, fulfillment within the community um, as ambassadors of Jesus and um, ones that were there to, to love on the people there, like it was just... Uh, we, uh, we attended a, a family meeting, a church meeting they had after a service one day. And the, we, we had enough when the topics of discussion were, there are too many Haitians coming mm -hmm. and the church is not meeting my needs. Mm -hmm. That's when we realized like, wow, this is really a social club for missionaries to escape the hopeless situation that's just outside the, the compound walls. And, and uh, the fact was that out of all the NGOs present, like no one had real answers to these people's day to day problems. Um, and we were then weeping every night saying, why are we here? What have we done? We're actually making situations worse. You know, we're, we're part of the problem here. We talk about poverty specifically because of the roles of church in, in the community um, and how that changes the view on poverty because when you start loving for each other and caring for your neighbor and everything, all of a sudden life looks just a little bit differently and maybe poverty doesn't look the same anymore, but um, Jesus literally radically changes community. Um, through the role of church specifically. Yeah, um, I'll share this story real quick uh, because it, the Lord used it to, to change my own heart. Um, we had a, a medical team come from the U.S. and uh, we were outside of an area called City Soleil, which is one of the, uh, has the, one of the worst crime rates, a city that has one of the worst crime rates in, in the world. We were doing a medical clinic just outside of that place at a, a legacy church. This guy had a building. We were in there doing a medical clinic, doing our best to, to keep control of the people by allowing them to sit outside. We'd call their number. They'd come into the clinic, into the church building. They'd see a doctor. They'd get medicine, prayer, would hear the gospel, and then head out. Um, and, uh, you know, for the most part, most of the day was pretty orderly. Well, this, this guy came into the clinic. And, uh, you know, he was just kind of unkept. Uh, he clearly been drinking, kind of started marching around like he owned the place, barking orders. Uh, clearly, he was just kind of looking for trouble. Jeff D and I pulled him aside, trying to keep him away from the American team, to keep him out of harm's way. We gave him some vitamins and, like, ibuprofen or something and kind of shoved him out the door, hoping that he would be satisfied. Well, he wasn't satisfied. He was angry. And we eventually kind of shoved him down the street, like on the pathway towards the dirt path towards his, his home, towards the village. And we just kind of, you know, dusted our hands off, thought the, the problem was solved. And, uh, you know, go back in the clinic. A few minutes later, we hear this loud boom on the tin roof of the building. You know, first thought it was like a mango or something. Uh, and then we kind of hear a commotion from the people outside. So I stick my head outside just as I see that same unkept boss man throwing a rock right at the window of the church building. Uh, and then a guy standing next to him throwing another rock and then another guy. It's like this, this dude went home and got his, you know, his posse. He got his boys and they came back, these three dudes, just causing uh, a mess, throwing stuff, uh, screaming out. At that point, I couldn't speak Creole. So all I'm hearing is the word Blanc. I knew they were talking about the Americans. And, uh, and so then I'm, I'm telling Jeffy, shut down the clinic. We're going to get out of here. And so they've packed up all the boxes. We're going to get the, the American team on the bus. Uh, right, as, right as we make that decision, I hear sirens in the background. And this police truck comes flying down the dirt road. And before it can even come to a stop, these two dudes in full like military tactical gear are leaping out of the back of the pickup truck and before their feet even hit the ground, they're opening fire with these automatic weapons as the, the, uh, the three bad dudes start running down the dirt path, you know, away. And, uh, and they're opening fire right as our American team is passing through the middle to get to the bus. 
And so, like, our team just hits the dirt. People are screaming. Some of them run to the bus. Some of them run back into the church building. It's just complete chaos. Well, you know, one of the bullets finds its target. The dude gets shot in the back of the leg, hits the dirt. And they come over and just wail on him, like, you know, tactical boot in the ribs, the butt of the gun in the face. By the time they get him up into the back of the truck, he's just bleeding. They toss him. They zip tie his arms behind his back, toss him in the back of the pickup truck. Long story short, we end up at the police station, Jeffy and I and the local pastor, to give our report. And this dude who was barking orders is now zip tied to the window of the police station, you know, blubbering mess, crying like a baby. And um, we gave our statement and we left. And I don't know, I don't know whatever happened to that guy. But the Lord, like, uh, I don't know, he, he wrecked my heart after that day. Because I didn't know that guy's name. I didn't know his story, like what brought him to such a place of anger and brokenness. I didn't even try to know his story. Uh, and I'm thinking, like, aren't those the messy guys that Jesus loved? And my attitude was get him out the door because I don't want to deal with him. He's messy. Because he's messy. And I, I don't know what happened to that guy that day, but I committed never again. Like, those are the people that we're supposed to be here to, to reach. Those are the people that, that we failed. I failed that guy that day. We were desperate. Um, we got to a point of of giving up and going home. Like I don't, I don't want to be a missionary anymore. Especially not by so ugly. <laughs> especially not by the yeah. yeah our current definition at the time of what a missionary is and does. Uh, I had no desire to be involved in it at all. Um, and uh, and so like we were already at this just this point of desperation um, where. Uh, you know, we, you know, the, the constant sea of need at our gate, um, of, you know, the, the pastor whose family hadn't eaten in three days because he had no money or the guy whose family died, the teenager whose family died in the earthquake. And now he's living on a tent with his kid's sister on the side of this road and she's got tuberculosis and, uh, and he's got nothing. Like these are the needs that were just constantly at our gate. And so, you know, we gave recklessly, we gave without discernment, without thinking through long-term effects like sustainability or dependency. We just gave because Jesus said give. And so we gave and gave until we had no time, no money left. Like we gave until everything was exhausted. And then we looked around our community and nothing had changed. Haiti wasn't any better. Nothing had changed. And um, so that, that story was, was all in the midst of us reading about CPMs and connecting with No Place Left and trying to figure out tools, trying to reform our ecclesiology in some way, trying to figure out what church is supposed to look like. And, and then that, that incident is kind of like the, the hole that, that sank our our missional ship before God said, all right, let me show you something. Let me show you what I'm already doing. Yeah. So Keisha and I and Jeff D like we're digging through the gospels, like repeated readings of the gospels in the book of Acts and like nothing, it just didn't match. Like what we were seeing didn't look like anything we were reading in scripture. And yet I knew it could happen because I'm reading about, you know, a corrupt government system, uh, you know, corrupt system of government and religion and yet amidst that, we saw this like spontaneous multiplying movement of disciples and churches throughout the book of Acts uh, in, in the middle of, of the corruption and the poverty and everything else of uh, the Roman Empire of that day. And, and so I saw so many similarities between that and our Haitian context that we knew like this can happen. We believe God desires it. Uh, and so we just need to get out of the way and stop doing all the things that are preventing it from happening. Dave reached out to us, connected us with Carter, Troy, Jeff, Chuck, others um, that poured into us, got some training, implemented. Uh, we were, you know, already uh, at that point of discontentment. Um, 
and uh, and knew something needed to change, and uh, and so you know we were even already on the journey of, of sort of a an ecclesiastical reformation. Um, knew that the way we were doing church and doing mission uh, was in our minds not biblical, and uh, and so that was already kind of stirring in our hearts. Then MPL came in with the practical tools and the bigger vision, and uh, and then we started implementing that. Um, started in our own community, uh, just making disciples of our own neighbors in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Two things that God was really gracious um, and kind of set things up for us even before we understood what we were doing. Um, we did know that we needed an exit strategy going into it. And so that was huge. Um, other than that, we were really gimmicky uh, missionaries, but we did at least have the exit strategy um, in place. Um, and then the other thing was um, discipleship. And we knew that um, we were more comfortable doing that one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And so it was actually through the discipleship of the boys in our home that the pastors saw the results and that's what then kind of launched everything from there so that would be two main things that we we're very thankful that God kind of prepared in our hearts even previous to us having a clue what he was doing and so it started with Jesse we we um moved there and he kind of became our right hand guy um helping us around the city just helping us get to know the place and everything and um the more time that he spent with us um the more that we were able to do one-on-one -on -one discipleship and it was kind of through that that he discovered um that instead of going to the dr to pursue a medical degree that god was calling him to um full-time ministry and then we're sitting there going, okay, well, what are the next steps? Are we going to send you off to seminary? You know, what, what are we going to do? What are the next moves? And um, we homeschool our kids. And Jacob had just finished reading um, a biography by, uh, about Bonhoeffer. Wow. And, uh, Life Together. You know, his book, Life Together. Yeah. yeah. Um, and... So it was kind of like things just merging together at the right time. And we said, you know what? I think your time and our time would be best spent as much as we can just together. So we had to move in with us. Um, and then friends started coming over because, you know, he's living with us. So he's got his friends coming in and out um, of the house. As they came, uh, we then we're able to share the gospel um, then with those friends and one after another started coming to the Lord and, and they also happened to be at a place in their lives where they actually needed a home. It was cool the way it multiplies yeah. because we were, we were pouring into Jeffy and Jeffy's best friend, Herod, who I got to lead to the Lord and baptize, one of the only guys I baptized in, in our three years there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Jeffy, uh, reached his cousin Evans, uh, Herod reached his brother Skinny, uh, and then they ended up moving in with us too. Uh, and then that just kind of, so two became four, and then it became eight, and then uh, she actually drew the line at 10 because we had 10 extra beds. Uh, we had a bunch of bunk beds downstairs where we were going to host mission teams. We had 10 extra beds. She said 10 is the max, and it ended up being 12. <laughs> Uh, no, we had couches and you know yeah. floor and all that so they just kind of kind of made it home made it work. You know? but it really just became uh it became you know part of our local team in our community um you know some of them became really close timothy's uh where we poured a lot of time into guys like jeffy um and it really just kind of became the church that we live with uh you know, because of their own oikos, our house became this revolving door of people. And, uh, and it really just became this life on life. Uh, a lot of them just, you know, just assimilated into our family, went where we went. And uh, it became a, yeah, a really, uh, a really cool, uh, sweet time together. They started 
making disciples and churches started forming, um, we all lived together. So it may be their oikos, but they're, you know, coming and having different times of church in our home. But that was really cool as far as a coaching aspect is we could kind of see from afar, but be able to then report back, you know, and talk about things um, and kind of just work through the messiness of church planting and whatnot. It was cool. I remember this day coming downstairs and the guys are in the kitchen looking out the back window. I'm like, what are you guys looking at? And they're saying Ghana, who was 16 at the time, started his first church and they're meeting in the backyard. So they're all looking at the window, you know, looking out the yeah. window, watching Ghana lead his, his first church. <laughs> really cool. It's cool to see like several generations then being able to like peer on and yeah, it's just sweet. The Fisherman Church. Yeah, that's a, a, another long story, but a, a really cool one. Just a, a, just a God's faithfulness and our very little, very limited amount of training we were able to do with this brand new, really messy Fisherman Church with these rough fishermen and their families ended up only having three weeks with them. Uh, and, uh, and long story short, we got separated and a year later found out that that church had, uh, had continued meeting without our supervision or control, uh, had appointed their own elders and was becoming a, a healthy church. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's some cooler stories that go into that, but just, yeah. just, just proof of God's faithfulness that he's in control of this, even when we feel like it's out of control, you know, churches began forming, began to multiply. Then that turned into some legacy pastors kind of reaching out to us. Hey, what are you guys doing? We went in on it. We trained a whole bunch of people, uh, six Haitian legacy pastors, uh, committed to transforming their legacy church into a training and sending center. And, uh, and then they, they're the ones that, um, that blew things up. Like the spirit used them, you know, they're the cultural insiders. Uh, you know, they know the, the people, the culture, the language much better equipped, uh, for the task than, than us. And so, and, and so in fact, the Lord did you, he used them, uh, to do things far beyond we could ever uh, imagine. Um, yeah, so in the last three and a half years, uh, from went from zero to uh, now they're tracking uh, more than 7,000 churches, more than 150,000 baptisms. Uh, hundreds are being baptized every day. Uh, they're keeping up with population growth, which is insane to me like so and the lord just continues just to add grace upon grace uh and uh, and it's growing exponentially and most of this has happened since we've left in the last year you know um and so we're praising god for uh, for what he's doing uh there's a lot of challenges obviously uh it's really 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 messy i think if if americans actually saw uh how messy it was how they messy might. it is yeah, they might get a little uneasy about They'd that. They'd be concerned. <laughs> like it's it's a mess. Yeah. Um, but it's also a beautiful mess, in that we're seeing the spirit of God do things. Like and we're seeing like Rastafarians that I mean were the like I mean just the worst of the worst sinners you could possibly imagine, and now God's using them to coach and and train uh, hundreds of churches. Mm -hmm.